Turn number four. Matthew 4 this morning, and we will finish up Matthew chapter number 4. And when you find verse 18, if you're physically able, if you'll stand and we'll read this portion of Scripture finishing up verses 18 through verse number 25. Again, the title of the message, and we're finishing up what we did and started a couple weeks ago, is just simply follower or disciple. There's a difference between a follower just following along or being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18, Matthew chapter number 4. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Straightway is a great word. It means like, now. <laughs> they didn't wait, they just immediately did it. Verse 21, And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they, another great word, immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Well, let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, we do ask that you'd help us to be able to discern the difference between just being a follower and truly being a disciple. Lord, you've made a difference. You've delineated a difference in your word. Help us please to see it. Lord, forgive us for the times when we have gone other ways or other directions, when we failed to follow. We've went our own way. Lord, please help us. Thank you for loving us enough to draw us back. Lord, help us, please, to give our lives in discipleship. We're not talking about being crazy or hermits or any of those kinds of things. Lord, we're talking about engaging the world in which we live. And we'll thank you for the help that you give, and we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. We mentioned as we opened this a couple of weeks ago and just got through the first few verses here that there is a difference between being a follower, just following along and watching to see what happens. And if it works out, great, and then I'll continue following. But one of the distinctions of a follower, and we read it as we go through the gospel message, in fact, throughout the entirety of the, the New Testament, is a follower is one that sees how it works, and then if it works out for them, and it seems like, well, that's something I want to be a part of, then good and fine, and that's all well, and I'll continue to follow, but times don't always turn up roses, and there can be trouble and trial. And things don't work out like you and I always plan. And if we're just a follower, we can fall by the wayside and choose a different way or a different direction than what God is leading. But a disciple is there through thick and thin. A disciple understands who it is that has put a call on their life and realizes that what I'm leaving behind is not, it's not worthy of me going back to that occupation. It's not worthy of me taking that back up in place of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's certainly what we find these men doing in Andrew and Simon Peter and James and John. Now, were there times in Andrew's life and in Peter's life and in James's life and in John's life where they uh, didn't follow exactly how they should have? Yeah, yeah. In fact, we can get to the end of the book of John and we see Peter and he says those words that you've probably heard several messages on, I go a-fishing. In other words, I'm going back to fishing. This isn't working out like I thought it would work out. This, this wasn't what I thought I was signing up for. But Jesus, in, in grace, meets Peter on the shore and invites him, calls him back to true discipleship. And so we see 
after the, the passage in John that we just referenced, we see just a, a few weeks later in Acts chapter number 2 that this man who said, I'm going back to fishing because I don't know what God is doing and I don't understand all of it and it, because I don't understand, I'm just going back to something that I'm more comfortable with. We see him a couple of weeks later preaching a message with Holy Spirit power on the day of Pentecost and thousands trusting Christ as their Savior as a result. There's a difference that God made in Peter's life. There's a difference that God made in Andrew's life and in James's life and in John's life. They weren't just followers anymore. They became disciples. And I want you to understand that this passage is coming. Now, don't let this blow your socks off, but this is Matthew chapter number 4. We're getting ready to get into Matthew chapter number Five. Good. Excellent. One of our teen young people was able to make that math equation. Four plus one is five. Beginning in Matthew chapter number five is one of the great passages in all the scripture. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. You want to know what discipling looks like or what a disciple is or does, you need to read Matthew chapter number five, six, and seven. You need to read what Jesus teaches on that mountainside to those people who were following him at the time. He's going to teach them what a disciple really looks like. Here's how a disciple acts. Here's how a disciple thinks. Here's how a disciple speaks. Here's how a disciple behaves themselves. And so he's calling these men to be his disciples. We made just a couple of observations last week and we'll rush to get into the, the final part of the message this morning. First of all, every person has to follow Christ's call in their life. And what Christ's call does is, number one, it fixes what the priorities used to be in my life. When Jesus comes and appears to Andrew and Peter and then to James and John, you understand that they are they, their occupation is, how they provide for their, themselves and their families is through fishing. Their priority was, was really mostly about themselves, to be quite honest. And as you read through the Gospels, you see time and time and time again how that their thoughts continue to come back to themselves. Well, what about me? What is this going to do for me? Lord, what do you think about me? Who's going to be greatest? Is it me? And they do this regularly because their, 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 their priority is still about themselves, even at this time in life. Yes, I know that they left all. I know that they, they, they immediately, straightway forsook their nets and they followed him, but they're not disciples yet. I know a lot of Christians like that who have forsaken a lot of different things, and those are all good things. And they've trusted in Christ as their personal Savior, but they're just still following. They're just still waiting to see how it turns out. They're still waiting to see if God does for them what they expect or think God should do for them in their life. Well, God said He'd never leave me and forsake me. God said He'd take care of me. And so I'm just, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. And if not, then I'll go to plan B and I'll take care of myself and I'll, I'll work for myself and I'll gain things to myself. By the way, we're going to talk about that tonight in the life of Solomon. Boy, what a, what a tragic story. So these men understood, or they, they begin to understand, as, as Jesus walks with them and talks with them and teaches them, and then as they watch him be crucified and buried, and they, they, they don't know what's going on, and, and they, they see as he raises from the dead, they, they begin to understand him more and more and more, and then the Holy Spirit comes and they become to be these disciples that Jesus is going to teach them about, going to tell them about, going to try to grow them to be. So what are my priorities? What are the things that drive my thoughts? What are the things that drive my, my, my desires? What motivates me to get up in the morning? Is it earning money? Is it power, prestige? Is it a position that I might get? Is it taking care of my family? Is it interaction with my friends? What is it that, that drives the things that I do? What am I investing my, not just my money in, but what am I investing my life in? That's a good test of what, what drives me, what my priorities are. And the word follow that Jesus uses here in Matthew chapter number 4, 
It means to, to join or to accompany, to get on the same road as, to keep going the same direction. That's a great picture of what discipleship truly is. He said in verse number 19, and it's not, by the way, it's not a suggestion. It's not a request. Jesus speaks in verse number 19, and this is a command to these men. Hey, follow now. Right now, you leave what you're doing. You follow me. I will make you fishers of men. These men had their priorities changed, but secondly, they had their, their focus changed. Rather than focusing on the here and now, rather than focusing on where do I next cast the net, where next are the fish biting, where is the next place I can gain profit for myself and for my family, Jesus is calling these men from just being followers. And you remember, in the Gospels, they had already trusted Christ. They'd already come and, and put their faith in Him. Now He's calling them to follow, them in a, follow Him rather, in a greater way. Jesus wasn't saying that fishing was wrong. Nor does He say that everyone has to be or is called into full-time service for Him. That's not what is being said here in Matthew chapter number 4. What He is saying is, is your focus solely on your occupation? Or is your focus more on what God is calling you to do with the rest of your life? Because Jesus is trying to teach these men, and he says it very clearly in verse number 19, that rescuing people from sin is God's greatest concern. Keeping his people from sin is God's greatest desire. He, he wants to keep you in fellowship with himself. Because, get this, he loves you. He wants nothing more than to shower you with His love, His grace, and His mercy. And yet we who just seem to be following will come in and out of God's relationship that He gives to us. We will come in and out of His blessing rather than just dwelling where it is He wants us to dwell. And so he says, I'm going to give you men, I'm going to give you the good news, the gospel to give to everyone that will listen to you. When Jesus calls these disciples to himself, he is calling them, by the way, at the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 19, he's calling them to make disciples. He's calling them to evangelize the world around them. Well, that's what he calls me to as well. That's what he calls you to do also. It's not just the pastor's job to do evangelization. It's not just the staff person's job to go out and, and engage the culture that they live in and to witness for Christ. That's your job. That's what he's given all of us to do. He is calling us to not just be a follower, he's calling us to be a disciple. And so I want us to finish this this morning, and I want us to see some things about the life of discipleship. And I want us to, to just start with, number one, discipleship. A life of a disciple is a life of obedience. A life of obedience. These men are, are called to follow Christ. And verse number 20, they straightway left their nets and followed Him. Verse number 22, they immediately, James and John, immediately left the ship, and notice, and their father, and followed him. Obedience is like a, a bad word today. <laughs> I, this past week, in just driving to, to different things and different appointments and engagements and meetings and, and different things around the city, I have seen three different times this week, I'm talking like in the last five days, I have seen a bumper sticker that says the same word, resist. The same word. It's on different cars. And as I drive by, you ever like see a bumper sticker like, what person would have that on their car? And you try to like look over like, kind of weirdo are you, man? So that's what I did. <laughs> I drove by and like, <sighs> and my first initial reaction was like, <sighs> What a loser. <laughs> but then the Lord spoke to my heart and saying, Okay, son, where are you resisting me? Because the very idea of someone paying money, this is what amazes me. 
finding that bumper sticker in a store and grabbing it out of the rack and saying, I'm going to spend my hard-earned money on this. And I'm going to put this on my car so I can get my message out to the world around me. Resist. The very idea of resisting means I don't like who's in authority. I don't want authority over me. And so I want you people to join with me and let's make a resistance. To which my first question always is, who's going to lead the resistance? And are we supposed to resist them? <laughs> Who are we resisting? Why are we resisting? What if I'm going to resist you? What do you think about that? The very idea of resistance today, it just, it, it, it screams that, that we want to be in charge rather than whoever else is in charge at the given time. By the way, uh, that crosses political, political lines. Yeah, if a Democrat's in charge, Republicans are going to put resist stickers on their car, secede. I mean, every other kind of bumper sticker we find out there today. And if a Republican is in charge, oh, we're going to see some folks have some stickers on their car. Resist, anarchy, and all these other statements that we like to make. We like to question authority. By the way, I've seen that bumper sticker plenty as well. Those, those thoughts in the world that we live in today are just so much more inviting to us because we want to, again, we want to be the ones who are in charge. But Jesus' words here in verse number 19, follow me, again, are a command. They're, they're an imperative statement. Which is why those listening to Jesus did exactly what Jesus told them to do. In fact, they, they left their fishing nets, they left their boats, they left their counting tables, whatever else that occupied them, they left those things and they followed Christ. And I think the Bible is, is declaring to us that without obedience, there is no genuine Christianity in your life. Without you obeying your master, by the way, that's capital M master. Without you obeying your master, there is no genuine Christianity in your life. You cannot rightly say, I am a disciple of Christ and then go your own way or not listen to what it is he would have you to do. You cannot rightly say, I'm a follower of God, I'm a Christian, I am a little Christ, and not do what it is He wants you to do. You can't act the way that you think is okay and live in disobedience to, to the, the Savior of the world and rightly say, I'm living genuine Christianity. True disciples hear their Master and they obey. Discipleship, number one, is a life of obedience. Number two, discipleship for these men, discipleship for you and me, is a life, secondly, of repentance. Do you remember the message of John the Baptist preaching? In fact, if you don't, you can go left just a little bit to chapter number three and verse number two. Matthew three, look again, verse number two, just be reminded of the message that John was preaching. And saying, what's the first word? <laughs> Repent, repent ye. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Discipleship is a life of repentance. Well, that was John the Baptist and he's weird and he wears, you know, camel and goat skins and he eats locusts and he's disgusting. <sighs> he probably came up with that message himself. Wanting us to live that life of a gross, disgusting, smelly hermit. Well, Look at what Jesus' message is in verse number 17 of chapter 4. Jesus begins his earthly ministry, and notice what his message is. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So question. Is it possible for me to be a disciple and not follow Christ with repentance? No. Now see, I can follow along and, and see where God leads, but if I'm not repentant, that is, if I'm not having my mind changed, that the other way, that all other options are subservient, are lesser, are worse than the path that God has for me, I cannot be a disciple.
I cannot stick one foot in following God and keep one foot in following myself or one foot in, let me see how it works out and if not, I've got another plan. I can't do that and be called a disciple. A life of discipleship, the life of a disciple is found not only by obedience but secondly by repentance. It is impossible to follow Christ without repentance. By the way, it's impossible for you and I to be saved without repentance. We're not talking about you working to gain God's grace. That's not what repentance is. We're not talking about a work salvation. We're talking about my mind being changed and understanding that the way I was going was a way of destruction and sinf sinfulness, excuse me, and the way of God is trust and obedience. Jesus is the holy, sinless Son of God. He's never taken one step, not, not one step in any sinful direction. He's never had a sinful thought enter into his mind. Anyone who is following him, therefore, must by definition turn their back to sin and set their face toward righteousness. That's being a disciple. Not going in the way of sin anymore. Not saying foul language like I used to say. Not engaging in activities I used to engage in. Not going in some places I used to go. Not hanging around with some people I used to hang out with. But forsaking those, leaving those, and following after God. That's the life of a disciple. Now, should I still have a witness and testimony to those I am leaving behind? You better believe that I should. By the way, I'm doing wrong if I just turn my back and leave them to a Christless eternity. That's not being a disciple either. God in, in Christ is not calling these men to simply leave everything that they've ever known. No, he says, follow me and I will make you what? fishers of men. You won't turn from men. You'll look to them to try to draw them to me. You'll introduce them to who I am and what I want to do in their life. So when Christians sin, and Christians do sin, you sin. Sinners. When you sin, the very next thing I should do is confess that to God. Agree with God about it. Lord, I have sinned. Confess it. Turn from it. And be restored back to fellowship with Him. Great old commentator said this, Anyone who thinks they can follow Christ without renouncing sin is at best sorely confused. Discipleship is a life of obedience. Discipleship is a life of repentance. Third, discipleship is a life of submission. Jesus is going to teach these disciples wonderful lessons about discipleship and he's going to use the illustration in one instance of a yoke. It suggests submission to Christ for work that he has assigned. You remember, he says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, you don't just get to skate scot-free. There's work to be done. So join in the yoke. And the idea of a yoke is I'm together with this other ox. <laughs> It's me and the other ox in the yoke and we're pulling together. However, do you know when I'm a disciple, who's on the other side of the yoke? It's not another Christian. I don't join up with another Christian and let's do the best that we possibly can, brother or sister. No. The other person in the yoke is Jesus Christ. Take my yoke upon you. Well, if Jesus is on the other side of the yoke, I'm just kind of like feet dangling. Because he is... He's guiding. He's directing. He's the source of power. I'm not adding any power to this work that's being accomplished. It's all His work. He asks me to be obedient and come alongside Him. And then what He wants to do with me is He wants to use me as the instrument to get the message to the world around me. It's His yoke. He gives the power and the strength and the ability. He just says, be faithful. Live in submission. The very idea of me being in a yoke is me being one of submission. If you've worked with horses, you know what a wild Mustang is. A wild Mustang has to be broken. That's the idea. When it's broken, it's not, um, 
Boy, we use the word meekness. It's a great Bible word. And you've probably heard this explanation before, but it's just good to be reminded of. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. And so that horse that, by the way, could take your life, if it wanted to, as a wild stallion, when it's broken, becomes power under control. And so now I pull on the rein a little bit, and it turns that way. And I pull on the rein this way, and it turns that way. And I tell it to giddy up, and that thing takes off. It's power under control. Submission is using the talents and gifts that, and abilities God has given to me under submission, not for my own will and way, but for God's will and way. And the very word submission means to be placed under the authority of another. And so these men who are used to being their own boss, Andrew, Peter, James, John, they had to learn what it means to be placed under a much higher authority, authority with a capital A. And you see them in Luke chapter number 5. And you don't have to turn there for the sake of time, but you see them in Luke chapter number 5. What are they? They're fishermen. And they are in the boat all night casting their net. Jesus comes along. You catch anything? We've been out here all night. They haven't cast anything. Cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now, we're not talking a yacht. We're talking a small boat. Like, here's one side of the boat. Here's the other side of the boat. Cast your net on that side of the boat. <laughs> uh, Lord, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, we're fishermen. <laughs> we just cast our net on that side. You think that just casting a net on that side of the boat, I mean, it's like, we're going to catch fish? But you remember the statement that is made? Nevertheless, at thy word, we'll cast. So they've been doing it all night in their own strength, their own power, using their own wisdom, caught up nothing. Jesus speaks. And because they submitted themselves and obeyed, Christ knew exactly where the fish were. And they throw their net. And you remember the result? They can't even bring it into the boat. There's so many. I use that illustration all the time in talking about simple soul winning. See, it's not my job to say, you're not saved, you can't be saved, I don't know that you can be, and, and say, well, they won't receive it, they won't get it, they'll tell me to get away. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to go find the fish who God's been working on their heart. And I cast my net in different spots. And Jesus says, cast your net here, and that's what I do. And I live a life of submission to whatever God would have me to do. That's what I want to do. So God says, here's what I want you to do with your life. Okay, but Lord, I'm already established in this. I'm already doing this. I mean, what, what are you talking about? I want you to follow me. Well, Lord, that means a total life change. I want you to follow me. If I'm not found following, I cannot call myself a disciple. Discipleship is a life of submission. They had done what they knew best, but yet God speaks, and when they finally obey, God brings the blessing. You want to be a disciple? Great. It's going to mean obedience. It's going to mean repentance. It's going to mean submission. Fourth, discipleship is a life of trust. You understand it's impossible to follow Christ without trusting Him. Because a lack of trust in Christ is going to cause me, it's going to cause you to deviate from the path He takes. It's going to cause me to choose to follow something or someone else other than Him if I'm not fully trusting. Then, on the flip side of that, it's impossible to genuinely trust Christ and not follow Him. Because a failure to follow means a person is committed to some other goal or is trusting, again, some other thing or some other person. Discipleship is a life of faith. Oftentimes when people ask me, well, what's your life verse? What, what verse you know, really has been a help to you or what do you like? Well, honestly, the whole Bible. But I oftentimes will say Colossians 2 in verse number 6. It's a tremendous verse. And what it says is, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. So how do I receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, I do that by faith. 
I just have to trust that what he said in his word is absolutely true and that I'm a wicked, filthy, rotten, nasty sinner. And because of that, I, don't, I deserve hell and death. But because of what Jesus did, because of his love for me, he died on the cross for my sins in my place. And if I will repent of my sins, confess them, and trust Christ to forgive my sin and save my soul, then he said that he would. That's how I receive Christ, by faith. So what Paul says in Colossians 2 is, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, by faith, so walk in Him. By faith. Trust Him. He knows what is absolutely best for your life. And in the areas where you and I do not trust, again, we are coming up with our own plan. We are saying, well, I've got all these other things that I think might work if this doesn't work out. It will cause me to deviate from the plan the first time trouble comes or trial comes, or a detour that I wasn't expecting, or a diagnosis that I don't like. It will cause me to lose trust. Fifth and finally, discipleship is a life of perseverance. Following is not a, an isolated act. That is, it's not just done once and then it's good for the rest of time, no. Following, discipleship is a lifetime commitment that's not fulfilled until the race is won. Not fulfilled until the final barrier is crossed. The crown is received. And all the rewards that I have been given by God are then laid back at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's when it's over. Following Jesus is not just like a door that's to be entered. Discipleship is a path that I follow. Well, here's what God wants me to be, and so I'm going to follow the best that I can. Now, take your Bible to Psalm 119 and we'll finish. Psalm 119. Look at verse 105. A life of perseverance. Following the path God has for me until the time he calls me home. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Notice, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Now listen to verse number 112. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always. Even unto the end. In other words, God, my life seems to be threatened almost daily because of my enemies. And I'm, I'm tempted to go off the path. I'm tempted to go my own way. But Lord, because I've inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, I said that's what I would do. I want to live the life of a disciple, Lord. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to keep going unto the end. And so I, I want you to understand, Jesus leads his new disciples. I want you to see what he, he calls them to do once they follow him. Back to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew 4, look with me what they do then immediately after they follow him. Verse number 23 of Matthew chapter number 4. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So he calls these disciples, he calls these men to follow him. He's going to make them to be fishers of men. And then does he take them to a secluded place? And says, let's hide out to the end. <laughs> let's just hang on to the end. Let's, let's uh, start this thing called the church and then let's just gather together us four. And if somebody chooses to join us, well, that's great. But if not, then we're just going to hang out to the end and we're going to persevere. And man, we're just going to hope that the world doesn't come in and invade us. Is that what he did? No. 
No, he took those men who had recently decided to follow him in a greater way, in a life of discipleship, and didn't keep them secluded. He engaged them in the world around them. He goes out and he teaches, and he preaches, and he heals. He does all of these things to go out, get out, go from out from this place, get in here, be encouraged, be healed, be strengthened, and then go out into that place and pass along the message that you've been given here. Don't keep it here. Don't leave it here. Go out into that world and give out the message there. Teach, preach, serve. That's literally what the word healing has at its root is the word service. Do that for others. This church is not supposed to be a hideout where we hang on till Jesus comes. Now, we ought to enjoy one another and enjoy the, the singing and enjoy the giving and enjoy the serving and all of those things. We ought to enjoy watching our young people and seeing them uh, sing songs and then watching them graduate and, and go on into adulthood and then serve their lives for Almighty God. But this is not a hideout for us. This is not a place where we just come and sit and soak and say, boy, I hope Jesus comes today. Well, I do too, but until then, he's given me a, a responsibility. He's given me a task to engage in. That's the life of a disciple. Giving the gospel, the get this now, hold on to your hats, the good news. Good news. Not bad news. Good news of the gospel, what he has, can do in the life of every person that will come to him for forgiveness and for eternal life. What does it take to be a disciple? Oh, just obedience and repentance and submission and trust and just perseverance. Well, that sounds hard. Well, he never said it was going to be necessarily easy. But he gives strength for the day. He gives you power to do each of those things. And we started with this message that there's a difference between that person who follows and one who is truly a disciple. Now, look at verse number 25 of Matthew chapter number 4. He's called Andrew, Peter, James, John. They've left all and they've followed. That happened before the teaching, the preaching, the miracles that took place in 23 and, 20, and 24. Now verse number 25, look at what happens, the response of the crowd. And there, what's the word? There followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from beyond Jordan. After the miracles, after the healing, after Jesus does something for them, they begin to follow. Now, one illustration, and I promise we're done. It won't take us two minutes. Matthew, look at John chapter number 6. John 6. I want you to see the difference. John 6, look at verse number 1. This is a parallel time, all right? Right in here, verse number 1, chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is in the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude, notice, followed him. Because, notice why they followed. Because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there sat he with his, notice a different word, disciples. Now, what happens in between here is five loaves and two fishes. Hey, what are we going to do to feed these people? Well, we're going to take a little boy's lunch and we're going to multiply it and use it and everybody's going to get to eat. Well, when you feed people, guess what happens? They come. <laughs> Some of the biggest days in church are, man, we're going to have a free chicken dinner. Oh, man, I feel good. I think I can get to church now. <laughs> well, the same thing happened in the life of Christ. Look at verse number 15, John 6. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force. Now notice, this is the multitude that had followed that was, man, we can't believe all that you've done. And notice what their purpose was to make him a king. In other words, an earthly king, dethrone Rome, bring us into the promise God's given to us. It's not that time yet. When he saw that they were going to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself 
alone. He sends his disciples out. A storm comes onto the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse number 22. The day following, Jesus goes out to them. He says, be not afraid. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one whereas his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the Lord had given them thanks. In other words, the word spread. We're going to come back to where Jesus fed everybody. Then we want to see it happen again. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, but not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Beginning in verse number 28, he begins to teach them about who he really is and what he really is going to do in their life. And there's some difficult things that he says. Well, notice verse number 66 then of John 6. Verse 66. After they heard what it means to really be a disciple, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So then, verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, But we had multitudes, multitudes following. There's twelve left. So Jesus says to the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, What's the word? Lord. Lord. That's the word of a disciple. Lord, I'm under your authority. Lord, I'm trying to live in submission to you. I can't rightly call him Lord unless I'm doing those things. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe. And I love this. And are, what's the word? Sure. (laughs) We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it right. He's beginning to learn what it means to be a disciple. Is it always going to work out the way that you want? Unfortunately, no. But on the same coin, fortunately, no. It's not always going to work out like you think because you don't know everything. You don't know what's best. You don't know the life Christ is calling you to. You don't know the blessings and the rewards He wants to give to you if you'll just simply follow. (laughs) So, the question then is, will you follow? Not just follow to see how it works out, but will you be a disciple? Because in beginning next week in Matthew chapter number 5, you and I are going to learn what a disciple really looks like. And it might be a little bit different than what we originally had in mind. So will you be a disciple? Don't just be a follower. Be a disciple. Let's pray. Lord, thank you very much for the day. Thank you for grace and mercy and love. Lord, we're grateful for the life that you have called us to. It's not a life of just going our own way, doing our own thing. It's a life of a disciple. So Lord, please help us understand, discipleship looks an awful lot like submission. Looks an awful lot like humility. Looks an awful lot like a life of trust and faith. 
It's, it's characterized by a life of perseverance. Lord, please help us to be found in those things, not looking for plan B, not waiting to see how everything works out and then coming up with our own way. Lord, help us not to just follow because of what you do for us. Help us to follow because of who you are. And we'll be very careful to thank you for it. Heads about, eyes are closed. I want to give you opportunity. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that your sins are forgiven, you don't know that if you were to die today or if the Lord was to come back today, you don't know why you should go into heaven. By the way, it's not because you're a good person. It's not because you earn it. It is only because the gift that Christ wants to give to every person, that's the gift of eternal life. But you have to accept the gift. You can't get there because grandmother or mom or dad, because you grew up in church, you can't do it because of that. You can only do it because you admit your sin. You agree with God about it, you confess it, and you trust Him for forgiveness and for life. Heads about, eyes are closed. You just lift your hand long enough for me to see it. Preacher, you pray for me. I don't remember ever doing that in my life, personally. I don't remember a time when I've ever trusted Christ as my personal Savior and asked Him to save me. Anyone at all, you just lift your hand long enough for me to see it. Put it right back down. Preacher, you pray. I don't remember ever doing that. I don't know that I've done that. Anyone at all, you just lift your hand long enough for me to see it. Put it right back down. Preacher, would you pray for me? Anyone at all? All right, then. I didn't see one hand raised. So by your confession, you're saying, I've done that and I know it. Are you living your life for self? Are you a follower? Or are you a disciple? Do other things take priority or does God take priority? Do you want to find yourself pleasing Him? Or living for the things that please you? I'm telling you, God's calling us to a life of discipleship, a life to please Him. And if you're not found there, then guess what? Today, you can confess that and ask for His help to do it. He wants to help you to do it. He's saying to you, follow me. Follow me. I'll make you to be a fisher of men. In just a moment, we're going to pray. We'll stand to our feet. The Lord speaks to your heart. You need to come. Obey the Lord and come. Whether you raised your hand, whether you didn't, whether that's for salvation or questions about joining the church or being baptized, any of those things, we're inviting you to come. Now, Lord, please help during the time of invitation. Help these people. They're yours. Lord, they said they're saved. They, they didn't raise their hands. They believe that they trusted Christ. If there's somebody here that hasn't, then Lord, help them to understand their sinfulness and yet the free gift you want to give to them. Help them to get that settled today. Lord, if they are saved, then help us, please, all of us, to not live life for self but for you. Help us to be found being disciples. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The Lord speaks as the piano begins to play.